and welcome to the Alabama Public Health Training Network. Thank you for joining us today for our program, Everything You Need to Know About Service Animals. If you have a question about anything being discussed today, please call or email during our broadcast. The phone number and email address are on your screen now and will appear again later in the program. Also, the handouts are available online. You will need to register for this program in order to access that material. I'm Danita Rose, Employee Relations Officer and EEO Coordinator for the Alabama Department of Public Health, and I would like to introduce our presenter for today. Dr. Graham Sisson is Director of the Governor's Office on Disability and Assistant Attorney General. Welcome, Graham. Thank you, Danita. Uh, welcome to everybody uh, here live and everybody uh, listening, uh, watching this video. Uh, today we're going to give a very quick overview of, of uh, service animals and what you really need to know about service animals. Make sure that uh, she, thank you for the fine introduction, Danita. Um, I'm going to have my contact information on the screen. Of course, uh, let me go back one. There's my contact information. And if you need to reach me after this, feel free to do so. Call me directly on the phone numbers listed on the screen or by email. Of course, uh, as an assistant attorney general, all information provided is non-binding. That means that it's still accurate. You just can't use it as evidence in a court of law. Today is the Ultra Reader's Digest version. We're hitting the main points, the most important points about service animals. Again, current law, service animals are defined as dogs that are individually trained to do work or perform tasks for people with disabilities, provide assistance to an individual with disability. Later on, we talk about what questions you can ask to determine if something is a service animal. You understand that definition a little bit better. And again, if if they meet the definition, animals consider service animals under the idea, regardless of whether they have been licensed or certified by the state or local government. It's important to remember, under the Americans with Disabilities Act and under the current law in the state of Alabama, there is no certification required for service animals. In fact, many people purchase uh, fake certification over the internet for $50. You can even get a vest or a, um, an official looking vest for a service animal for $50 over the internet. And the reason it wasn't the reason the ADA doesn't require certification is a lot of people with disabilities self-train their service animal. In fact, a fully trained service animal can cost up to $50,000. A lot of people with disabilities can't afford $50,000. And then the next slide, we'll talk about since March 15, 2011, that's when the new regulations under the Americans with Disabilities Act, and I call them new as an attorney because I think in terms of decades and stuff that comes out, a lot of big changes don't come out every year. That's the last major. Only dogs, and except in some rare cases, which we're going to talk about, miniature horses are recognized service animals under Titles 2 and 3. And we have a future slide where we're going to talk about animals that are specifically excluded from definition of service animals under the Americans with Disabilities Act. In Titles 2 and 3, what we mean by those, Title 2 are basically public entities or governmental entities under the ADA. Title 3 are private businesses. And many of the people working in public health inspect restaurants. Restaurants are considered entities, private businesses covered under Title 3 of the ADA. So if you hear Title 3, under the ADA, that's what it means. In this next slide, I have a picture, what I call a Fifi dog. It's a little tiny dog. It has a little hairdo sticking up. And a lot of people try to pass these off as service animals. And they say, well, it makes me feel better. It comforts me. Uh, that's a pet. That's not a service animal. It's not covered under the ADA. There are other laws where that can be acceptable, and if there's enough time, we'll talk about those other laws. But a service animal performs some type of function or task for the individual with a disability. 
that he or she cannot perform themselves. In some examples of tasks that you'll hear about alerting persons with hearing impairments to sounds or intruders, kind of like a guard dog. Also, pulling wheelchairs or carrying or picking up things for personal mobility impairment. A person with disability drops their keys on the floor. A service animal can pick those keys up and give them back to them. Opening doors, things that people have trouble doing. Other examples, assisting person with mobility impairments with balance. This is what you usually see with a very large dog, like a Great Dane. Um, those can help people have balance problems. They can lean up against the dog and it helps steady them. Providing minimal protection or rescue work. And this is typically, most people don't use service animals for that, but that's another acceptable task for a service animal. And then other tasks, you know, um, and we have a guest here today, we'll talk at the very end of the presentation, uh, Timothy Emmons, who has a service animal. He's going to describe what it does for him. But for folks who are blind, uh, helping guide them. Also, for alerting people who are deaf, as I mentioned, pulling a wheelchair, uh, protecting a person who's having a seizure, reminding a person with a mental illness to take prescribed medications, calming a person with PTSD or an anxiety task. Even people with diabetes will use uh, service animals at night to alert them when their blood sugar comes too low, prevent them slipping into a diabetic coma. They'll start barking, they'll wake person up, they'll eat something or drink something to restore their uh, normal sugar levels. And of course, a service animal is not a pet. You hear a lot of no pet policies. If a restaurant has a no pet policy, they can't apply that policy to a service animal because a service animal is not a pet. Other thing, it doesn't mean that a business must abandon no pets policy, but simply it must make an exception to the general rule for service animals. And of course, whoops, sorry, went over too many, let's see. And then the work or task that a service animal has been or a dog has been trained to provide must be directly related to the person's disability. And the dogs whose sole function is to provide comfort or emotional support do not qualify as service animals under the ADA. And basically, uh, service, I mean, emotional support, comfort, companion animals are not covered service animals under the ADA. They're covered under other laws like the Air Carriers Access Act and the Fair Housing Act. But in the realm of what you're going to be doing as public health inspectors, you're going to be inspecting restaurants. Restaurants are covered by Title III of the ADA, as I've said. So uh, comfort and emotional support and companion animals are not covered in that realm. All right. And the definition doesn't affect or limit the broader definition of assistance animal under the uh, Fair Housing Act or the broader deaf service animal of the Air Carriers Access Act. In other words, just because those two laws may cover comfort and companion and therapy animals or emotional support animals doesn't mean that the ADA does. All right. And... And again, the service animal must be permitted to, to follow the in, individual with a disability to all areas of facility where customers are normally allowed to glow. And that includes a hospital. A hospital, a service animal can follow somebody into a, a patient's room. But maybe intensive care may be different. Uh, it can't follow them into an operating room or in areas where a sterile environment is necessary. But if for purposes of a restaurant, the part of the restaurant where the public goes, a service animal can also go. An individual service animal may not be segregated from other customers. One of the central purposes of the Americans with Disabilities Act is full integration or inclusion of people with disabilities. You can say, okay, you can bring your, your service animal into our facility, but you all have to sit over here in a corner. Y'all can't sit over here in the nice area where you have a window. Now, a later slide, we're going to be talking about what about allergies or people that have fear of dogs. Does that give you a right to segregate a service animal in a separate part? And what you need to do is separate the person with a disability 
uh, in the surf sand will from the person that has an allergy or fear of dogs, but doesn't mean moving the person with a surf sand. It generally means relocating the person with the allergy or the fear of dogs. Those are not acceptable excuses for denying somebody entry with a surf sand. And as we'll later uh, see, and Tim will talk about that, an individual with service animal has to have that service animal under control. If it's not under control, that can be a reason for excluding that service animal. We once had somebody bring a German Shepherd into the governor's office, in the chief of staff's office, and it started attacking everybody in there, including myself. That was not a service animal. A service animal that's been trained either by the owner or by a professional training institute has that dog under control. And it also means, we say under control, it means that the animal is well groomed. It doesn't smell, it doesn't have the fleas or the insects that are, that are, are irritating to other people. It's also well groomed and well taken care of. And you can see from Tim's dog later on at the end of the program how well groomed and well taken care of his dog is. And the next thing, and this will kind of lead, so what happens if you suspect something is not a service animal? You see them carrying a dog on their shoulder, like that Fifi dog has that weird hairdo. It's a real small, what I call a yip yip dog. You can ask two questions. You can ask for documentation. I mentioned that before. Documentation is not required or certification. Uh, again, a number of states do um, have programs certified service animals. I think that's maybe where we're heading eventually. If we're going to see such an abuse of service animals, they may eventually change federal law to require certification. But the current state of the law is at the federal law, there is no uh, requirement for certification. And uh, that, if a state law requires certification, the federal law does not. The federal law trumps the state law. And a lot of states may have programs where they're permissive, where it allows you to have the state certified. And, and then local uh, codes. If local health code allows only mission of guide dogs for those who are deaf or blind, is a business or a public entity protective that follows the local law? And I'm pretending that y'all are interacting here. I think I heard somebody say, yes, you are correct. Okay, you are correct. So is a business or a public entity protected? It is not. It is not protected if you follow local law, because the ADA is a federal law, a supremacy clause of the United States Constitution. Federal law trumps uh, a conflicting state law. And of course, uh, if a business refuses, also more on local co codes, if a business refuses to admit any other type of service animal on the basis of local health department regulation or other state or local laws, then there's a violation of the ADA. And of course, the ADA provides greater protection for individual disabilities, so it takes priority over the local state laws regulation. Now, if state law provided greater protection, or local co codes provided greater protection, they would trump the ADA by virtue of Title V of the Americans with Disabilities Act. So for you legal eagles out there, if you want to look up Title V, you can see that if a local law provides greater rights than the ADA, the local law trumps the ADA. But in Alabama, so far we don't have any local laws that provide greater rights. There is one area, though, with respect to trainers of service animals under state law that I'm going to discuss in a minute or two. And then, of course, maintenance or cleaning fees. They cannot be charged, nor can a deposit or, or surcharge be imposed on individual disability as a condition to allowing the service animal to accompany or follow the person with disability, even if deposits are routinely required for the pets. That's the same rule, the no pets policy, but also the pet deposit policy cannot be applied to service animals. And then, of course, uh, more on maintenance fees. A public accommodation can charge customer disabilities if a service animal causes damage so long as it has regular practice of charging other customers uh, fees for damage. So it's above ordinary wear and tear uh, then the individual with a disability is going to be responsible like anybody else without a disability for the same types of damages. 
All right. Um, making sure, whoops, I went to one too far here. I, I didn't do too well in uh, video 101 in college, so, you know. Uh, maintenance or cleaning fees, again, for example, a hotel can charge a guest with a disability for the cost of repairing or cleaning furniture or damaged by a service animal if it is the hotel's policy to charge other uh, guests without disabilities uh, fees for the same type of damage. And the, this, this demonstrates, and the way you can remember this, the ADA is an equal opportunity law. If people without disabilities have the same requirements, people with disabilities can have the same requirements. And again, but except in the area of reasonable accommodation. Reasonable accommodation is something people without disabilities get that people, uh, people with disabilities get, that people without disabilities do not get. So it is preferential treatment. Okay, taxi cabs. We get a lot of questions about taxi cabs. Um, in the next slide, taxi uh, cab companies may not refuse to provide service to individual disabilities. They're also prohibited from charging higher fees if somebody has um, a uh, service animal. Then they charge other persons. I use a wheelchair. Sometimes uh, they try to charge me extra because I had to put my wheelchair in the trunk or in the back seat. That's illegal to do that. It would be the same for somebody with a service animal. And we hear questions about Uber. Is Uber covered by the Americans with Disabilities Act? Yes, Uber is covered by the ADA. They can also not charge extra fees for using uh, service animals uh, or for somebody that has a wheelchair or other assistive devices. Exclusion of unruly animals. I mentioned before about a service animal has to be under control of, by the owner. And uh, a business can't exclude the animal, including the service animal, when the animal's behavior poses a direct threat to the health or safety of others. An example given is service animal that displays vicious behavior towards other guests or customers may be excluded. What's vicious behavior? I think uh, seeing all of its teeth bared, you know, having its hair rise up on the back, it jumps on somebody. Uh, I've seen all that behavior. When we were talking about what happened in the governor's office, every single one of those behaviors happened with that animal. And it's very unnerving. It's almost like an attack dog. And that's why people have a fear of certain types of dogs, German shepherds, pit bulls. But uh, by the same token, you should not automatically think that somebody who has that type of service animal, that the dog is automatically a danger. Because people do use pit bulls. Um, they do use Dober, D Doberman pincers. I was trying to make sure I said that correctly, so don't ask me to repeat it, but no, I will if you need me to. So um, again, so you cannot stereotype certain types of dogs in the service animal world either. And again, um, a business can't make assumptions, okay? That's what I stated before, basically, is how an individual is li a particular animal is likely to behave based on past experience with other animals. Each situation has to be considered individually. Because sometimes, you know, some people may have their service animals under better control than others. So just put the, uh, give me the gong when I'm almost out of time. I think we're, we're doing pretty good on time here. So I want to leave plenty of time for questions and plenty of time for the demonstration of a live service animal. So. And again, Exclusion of unruly animals, again, it can exclude a, a public accommodation like a private business can exclude any service animals out of control, but should give the individual disability who uses the service animal the option to continue to access services and without having the service animal on the presence. Now, I don't want you to confuse this with the circumstance where a business says, hey, you can come in, but you've got to leave a service animal. But if that service animal is under control and it's well-groomed, the service animal should be able to go wherever the public can go. I'm talking about the situation where the service animal is not under control and its handler is not, is not well-groomed by its handler either. The service animal can be excluded and then it can go, and then the person with a disability can go. And you're saying, well, how that's going to happen? If they have a friend with them, maybe their friend could be the actors or guide for that limited circumstance. I don't know if you all heard about the case in Hawaii where they quarantined all service animals for a month. 
And so many people come over there and they're like, I can't be without my service animal for a month. So they had to change their policy for a quicker turnaround and quarantine, you know, for a few days instead of a whole month. So, and again, just more information about exclusion of disruptive animals. Um, again, when so, you can exclude a disruptive animal and firmly alter the nature of service. I can't think of a good example in a restaurant, but a lot of times people go to a restaurant for the ambiance. It's the setting. It's supposed to be romantic. It may not be as romantic if somebody's uh, service animal is barking all the time. Uh, the example given here on the slide is, is in a movie theater. People bark, brought their service animals in there. They're looking at the screen. They see something on the screen. They start barking loudly. That's where it disrupts the nature of the service, and they can be excluded for that reason. And that's the example given in the next slide about a dog barking during a movie. So. And the other thing, allergies, and this is what I mentioned before, and fear of animals are generally not valid reasons for denying access or refusing service to people's service animals. What you need to do if these, if these situations occur is try to figure out reasonable ways where you can minimize the effect of the allergy or the fear. And one way I mentioned is by separation. If it's at a big conference in a big room, don't put the people right next to each other, separate them by distance. And don't necessarily put the person with the service animal way back in the corner. Try to put somebody in a, a generally safe area where they still have reasonable access. And, uh, and there are things that can be to, can lower the incidence of allergies, like grooming and, and shampooing the service animal can help with allergies also. And here's some of those exclusions that I talked about before, or I mentioned that I would. And, and if I forgot to mention anything that I told you I mentioned before, please call me on the carpet there. There's nothing worse than somebody doing that. So, But new regs exclude wild animals, monkeys and others. Exotic animals are excluded, reptiles. Uh, I once gave the example of uh, somebody called me, they were a bus driver. Somebody tried to bring a boa constrictor on the bus. And this is before they changed the rule to exclude exotic animals. And I said, well, ask them two questions. Say, uh, do you use it because of a disability? I'm going to go over those again in a minute. And uh, what tasks does it perform for you? And the guy said, yes, I do use it because of a disability. He said, I have a seizure disorder, and when I'm about to have a seizure, it squeezes my neck. And to keep in mind, this is a bow constrictor. It squeezes my neck. Okay, and I said, all right, well, that's what it normally does. And ask him how he trained it to squeeze his neck. And the guy goes, well, it just knows. Well, of course it just knows. That's what it does. It's going to kill that guy. He's going to be dead. And he's not going to have to worry about seizure anymore. Okay, that's, he was trying to think of a way to bring a pet onto the bus. So uh, rabbits are excluded, farm animals, except for miniature horses. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Ferrets, uh, amphibians. Rodents. I've even heard somebody had a tarantula as a service animal. I don't. It was their guard tarantula or something. I don't know. It jumped on people. That's right. It jumped on people. So, um, and the regs clearly state that animals' primary function is provide most support, would not be service animal. Now, there's a difference here between a psychiatric service animal and emotional support animal. Is the service provided? The psychiatric service animal actually does something to help calm somebody down, besides just its presence. You know, normally if it's a pet, the individual has to pet the dog instead of the dog doing something for the individual. A psychiatric service animal does, but some people say this is a psychiatric service animal. Your next question should be, okay, well, demonstrate, show me what task it does for you because of your psychiatric illness or disability. And they should be able to describe what it does for them. So, and again, um, this, this is more information about a psychiatric, they're trained to perform specific work attack. Emotional support animals soul function provide a comfort, therapy, you'll hear these words, companionship, therapy with benefits, or promote emotional well-being. It doesn't really do anything to do that. Don't pets make you feel better normally? 
unless they're biting you or something, if they're mean, okay, if it's, if it's an attack dog. I'm talking about normally pets make you feel better. And they really emotional support animals or therapy animals, they will bring therapy animals into a hospital or into hospice situations to make people feel better. And then the next slide, we talk about miniature horses. You're like, when are we going to get to miniature horses? And really, they allow the use of miniature horses that have been individually trained to do work for and task for people with disabilities. Let me ask you, what is the difference between a service dog and a miniature horse? And I'm building up some anticipation here, okay? Just imagine a drum roll here. It's the amount you have to clean up. I'm just kidding. No. Seriously, okay? Serious. The serious answer is a lot of people have Mitch horse because they live longer. They live 10 years or more in conservice. You know, a lot of the big dogs can't, don't live that long or, or they become unable to serve as service animals. So that's what it's told that Mitch horses usually live longer. So the next slide is we're going to talk about uh, some, uh, they generally range in height from 24 inches to 34 inches, measure the shoulders, and generally weigh between 70 and 100 pounds. So they're not like the Clydesdale horses, you know, pulling the beer wagon, okay? Those are my favorite kind of horses because of what they pull, so. All right, so some more information about miniature horses. These are the factors uh, that you have to modify your policies to permit miniature horses where reasonable. Remember, miniature horses are the exception. They're not automatically considered service animals. There's four factors that a covered entity like a restaurant can use to measure to see if they're, if they're allowable. And again, um, in the four factors, let me hear another drum roll, okay? These are exciting, okay? Uh, the four factors are whether the miniature horse is housebroken. Of course, I told you about the output. They have as much output as a full-size horse. Okay, so you get all the all the you get all the advantages of the big horses there. Okay, whether the other the second factor is whether a miniature horse is under the owner's control. Obviously, a miniature horse from running around can cause a lot more damage because of its size. Whether the facility can accommodate the Mitch horse's type, size, and weight. There may not be sufficient space, or it may not be, it may be a type of facility where the structure is not strong enough to support that weight. Now, I know there's people that weigh more than that, so I think that's not going to be your best argument, okay? So, but those three factors, whether it's housebroken, whether it's under the control of the owner, whether there, the, there's physical constraints to allow use of that uh, miniature horse. And the last factor, so those three, whether miniature horse president will not compromise legitimate safety requirements for the safe operation facility. Now, obviously, you might not be able to bring a miniature horse into a hospital operating room. Or there may be more restrictions bringing a Mitch horse into a hospital. But again, if it's under, if it's housebroken, it's under the owner's control, you ought to be able to. Or into a restaurant. You know, into the kitchen might be one. Somebody is a, is a chef there, but they use a Mitch or a horse. You're probably going to be looking at that very closely as, a, as an inspector, a health inspector, aren't you? I hope you are anyway. If you aren't, call me up, okay? And I won't go to that restaurant, okay? <laughs> So safety is always a factor. That's why safety is our, that's why one of the rules of exclusion is if it's a danger to other people, either because of allergy or because it's not under control. All right, and here, um, and again, just reason for exclusion, removal, the, these things are repeated in the regulation. And the owner doesn't, the animal's handler doesn't take effective control or take any steps to get something under control. And it's not housebroken. We mentioned that. So, and again, a fundamental alteration of the service, and I, that is probably very rarely a reason for exclusion, as I mentioned before. And again, a direct threat to the health or safety that can't be eliminated by a reasonable accommodation. When I talked about allergies, you know, there's things, there's intervening steps that you can use to lessen the effect of the allergy. 
even if you got one of those HEPA filters things, you can put right next to the animal. I use those in my house because my I got three cats in my house, which my house is not like the cat lady. Okay, it's it's neat. Okay, we take very good care, but you have to do a lot of cleaning to keep it under control. But the safety issues, these are things that are a substantial risk of harm. They're not speculative. Many owners may say, well, this might happen, this might happen. You have to have objective facts or, or evidence that that will happen. All right? And hopefully I'm not too loud, but I tend to get excited on this subject because this comes up a lot um, in exclusion, okay? If an entity does exclude an animal according to the regulation, it must give the individual disability opportunity to benefit or participate from the services without having the service animal on the premises. So it may be that somebody could get the services over the phone if they were coming in for a consultation. Not just, you know, saying, hey, keep your animal here, follow us back here. You know, some people may be nervous about being separated from the service animal. And the only thing that I can identify if somebody said to me, well, you can come in here, but I've seen how you drive that wheelchair. You're going to knock the heck out of our doorways and our door frames and scratch, and you're going to trash place. So you can, you can leave your wheelchair behind, and then you can come with us. Well, it, there was a cartoon that this cartoonist called Callahan did, and he, he had quadriplegic, and he did these cartoons with a mouth stick. And he had two cowboys sitting on horses. They're out in the desert. They're looking down on the ground, and there's an empty wheelchair ahead. And the caption reads, don't worry, he will not get far on foot. So same thing with separating somebody from their assistive technology, whether it's a service animal or, you know, assist technology, they, they won't get far on foot. So, all right, let's see. And then again, the Fair Housing Act allows use of therapy or comfort animals. And sometimes you get in a situation where part of the facility they're going to allow serve comfort and therapy animals, like the dorms or the apartments. But then in the public service areas covered by Title III, you, you're not allowed, you don't have to allow those to be used. So there might be in a restaurant where they have part of it's a school. It's a school and part of it's open to the public. I can see that would be an area where you might... You know, or, or you might have part of it's a living area where they allow people to live and they demonstrate cooking. That might be an area where you th the comfort and therapy animal will be allowed there, but then another part of the facility that's just the classrooms where you wouldn't have to allow them. So I'm trying to think of some really good hypotheticals here, but when you ask questions, try to stump the chump with good hypotheticals. All right, so, okay, owner's responsibilities. Service animals should be harnessed, leased, or tethered unless these devices interfere with animal work or the individual disability prevents them from using the device. If it's somebody with quadriplegia, they're not going to be able to hold a harness or hold uh, a leash, okay? In that case, the individual has to maintain control of the animal through voice, signal, or other effective controls, and they can be trained to do that. All right, and there's a really good, uh, you can ask again, just to sum up, you can ask if the animal is required because of disability. You can't ask about what the disability is, but a lot of times they'll volunteer the information. Uh, what tasks uh, the uh, individual, the next slide, sorry, let me make sure. Um, and again, what work or task the animal has been trained to perform and we have a picture on the slide here of a blind person using a guide dog in a grocery store. So, again, here's the state law thing. We're getting close to getting to the interactive part of the session, okay? But I am amazed everybody is awake right after lunch. It's the first thing right after lunch, this, and it's a Monday too, okay? But the right of a person to be accompanied by a service animal is covered under state law in Alabama. Alabama law defines service animal the same way the ADA does. Um, and the other part of state law that's different from the ADA, and I've got it underlined here, a person training a service animal shall be entitled to the same privileges granted to a person with a disability uh, subsequent to, to the above subsection. So basically, 
a trainer service animal can go wherever a person with a service animal can go under state law. They're not a trainer of a service animal unless they have a disability is not protected by the ADA because the ADA covers people with disabilities. So that's something to remember. This is where our state law goes beyond the ADA and protects trainers of service animals that don't have disabilities. And it, it also protects trainers of service animals that have disabilities. But again, trainers of service animals without disabilities are not protected by the ADA, but our state law does protect their use their, and allows them to go wherever members of the general public can go. All right. And again, it doesn't relieve a person accompanied by a service animal from liability for damages. And that includes trainers also. Okay, these are the resources that we have on here. Uh, next slide. The uh, common asked questions about service animal place of business, an ADA business brief, the regulations. If you would like any copies of these emailed to you, you can call or email me at the numbers uh, listed in the slide presentation. They're free of charge. We're a state entity. We try to give you a break at the state. Yes, sir. I do have an email question. Sure, and that's questions, and then we'll, we're going to allow um, Tim to do his in a minute. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Are all law enforcement trained to deal with situations where service animals are denied entry? Unfortunately, no. Um, sorry, turn off your cell phones. <laughs> sorry about that. I thought I had turned off. So I think it's one of those emergency alerts. They call me every time. But anyway, so so our law enforcement prepared to or, or trained to handle service animals, and it depends. We do have something that we do training around the state called law enforcement and disability but we haven't trained every law enforcement agency in Alabama. So we're willing to provide that training, but I think it is a good idea for them to be able to distinguish between a service animal and a pet, or between a service animal and an emotional or therapy animal. Thank you for the question. I hope I answered it. Other questions? It must have been crystal clear because you don't have any questions, and I'm very impressed with y'all, not myself, but with you. So, so. But if you have other questions, I mean, we have a little bit of time. Uh, I want to. I'd like to give Tim about 15 minutes here, and then we we'll come back to questions at the end, because people are probably shy and they're thinking about questions. Tim, would you like to? The floor is uh, Tim the Emmons, who's a a colleague of mine. He's going to be. Uh, uh, introducing his service animal, Cody, and telling about the, maybe a little bit about the process of how he got his service animal, what his service animal does for him, and, uh, and how he maintains control and how he takes care of his service animal. Mm -hmm. And anything else? Uh, okay. Well, you just uh, help me with time because okay. I'm not going to see you waving over there, so you may want to clear your Well, I got, I got Chuck Berry, the Chuck Berry replacement from the Gong Show. Oh, yes. Yeah, he's, yeah. He's, he's on standby. Awesome. So. Great, great, great. Do I need to stand up or something? Yeah, like stand up and okay. come up front if you could. Up, 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 uh, go ahead, up, up. Yeah, no, boy. Can make sure, the, can the camera get him? Come. Have y'all got him on camera? I'm going to let them I'm gonna hold still for a second, and then you guys tell me what you need me to do. Okay. Do you, uh, can I just walk on up? up? Yeah, walk up okay. on front. And this was, uh, you had mentioned a brief demonstration. This would kind of give you an idea of what we what we do here. Cut it forward. How about that a boy? That a boy. How far up do you want me to go? Uh, right there's good. And if you can turn top. around to the front. There you okay, go. Yes, sir. Facing right. this way? No. That's perfect. Okay. You're right, perfectly All right. situated. Cut it set. Cut it set. Rest. He's not been on TV before, so he says, wow, what a day, what a day. Um, I'm Timothy Emmons. I, I work with the Alabama Public Library Service. I'm a reader advisor there at the library, and Cody is my, is my guide dog. He is a service animal. I went to Morristown, New Jersey to receive Cody from the Seeing Eye, which is a guide dog school that has been in operation for over 85 years. So they've been around for quite a while, and... Um, I picked them out of, there are a few schools that are, that are around and about, but I picked them because this being my very first guide dog, I wanted, you know, 
some of the best the best training that I could possibly get. And three and a half weeks to some folks seems, oh, that's not long at all. But that's three and a half weeks of grueling training that you go through as a trainer and becoming a part of the guide dog team. You're, you start the bonding process three days after you get to school. They learn your, the instructors learn how you navigate with your mobility, how you get around. And they figure out what kind of pull strength you need. And by that, by that I mean the harness that Cody wears is a guide harness. I have, hold on to that harness and he guides me with that harness and I'm able to feel which direction he's going or if he needs me to stop or needs me to move forward or needs me to, to move around obstacles, then he will move me around those obstacles and I can feel all of that movement through that harness. So they figure out what kind of pull strength you need and they pair you with that particular dog and they match your personality with that dog. And I have to say, they nailed it right on the head when they matched Cody and I. Because <laughs> he is adaptable, he does very well. He, for that particular thing, Graham had mentioned the cost of a service animal. Some service animals can be pretty expensive. I only had to pay $150 to, to obtain Cody. But that they covered food, travel, everything else, because he is something that I use 24 hours a day. He's with me. When he's out of harness, he's strictly, a, he, he's your regular house dog. He likes belly rubs. <laughs> so, but when he's in harness, he knows he's bus it's, it's all business. And he's really, he's ready and willing to work. Um, so they work with us on all of that and get everything together. And then we learn how to cross streets, navigate public places, malls, stores, office buildings, schools, that type of thing. Uh, busy populated traffic areas and non-populated busy traffic areas, you know, non-populated traffic areas where there's not a lot of traffic. So we, we learned how to do pretty much every route that you would possibly ever encounter in your lifetime in three and a half weeks. And it's Monday through Sunday pretty much. And I mean, even off the, when you're not doing routes and things, they have you training and doing things in what they call in-house, in the dormitories, because we, we stayed there for three and a half weeks. And we were not perfect coming home, but at least I had more of an idea of what I was doing to, to a point. <laughs> and I'm still learning. You know, there are still things that I'm still learning. But uh, some of the things, you know, that we, that we navigated, we, they even taught us how to fly um, when we fly on an airplane, how to, how to put the dog under the airplane seat and that type of thing. So we went through everything, every scenario, like I said, to to begin the process of becoming a fully bonded team. And that's what they, what they call guide dogs and their trainers. You are a guide dog team. You, you work together and are bonded. And after they say after that first year, that dog, you and that dog are pretty much on a telepathic level, if there ever could be. And we're not that perfect yet, but we're, we're getting there. <laughs> we're getting there. Um, he, the way that he leads me, uh, and one other thing I want to point out before I, before I go any further, one of the things with the harness that they, that they provided with us, a lot of schools do not include the strap that you see going down the center of his chest and going underneath his legs. Can you move that forward, kind of turn? Sure. Could he stand for a second? Up, up. Turn around. Turn around. Turn around. Maybe the camera can get that. I don't know. Can you all see that? Okay. Can the camera see that? Okay, good. <laughs> this right here is what they call the martingale strap. And a lot of people go, oh, wait, that looks like a horse saddle. Well, it's close. <laughs> it's very close. But it goes underneath his two front legs and across his chest. And it comes from that, that top of that harness. And what that does is gives a little bit more stability in that handle. So when he moves and he goes and he does his thing, I'm able to feel more movement. Without that, I don't get that much feedback. With that, the feedback is enhanced so that even if I can't see where I'm going, which, you know, is all the time because I am totally blind, that feedback shows me where, what kind of terrain we're encountering, where we're at, what's going on. I can tell if he's 
either trying to navigate me around something or, oh wait, I just saw a bird, I'm about to go after that bird, and I can kind of stop because, you know, he's a dog, he's going to get distracted on things, so they teach us how to take care of or control distractions. Uh, we, we keep, you know, keep down dog distractions, you know, because the, he, you know, he, he sees other dogs and he knows to, to not be, be bothered by those. So, you know, we, I keep him under control and focused at all times so that he can be my eyes. Um, that was, that's also, that's one of the things as well. When, when you see guide dogs, a lot of people see dog and they, they don't realize there's the harness and they, that he is working. But when Cody's in harness, he is strictly working. No, no calling to him, no talking to him, that type of thing. He distract, he will distract. And it could be a crucial time such as getting me across the parking lot through traffic. And somebody goes, oh, hey, Cody, hey, Cody. And Cody's going to automatically go where that attention is. That tail's going to wag. He's going to forget what he's doing because he sees somebody or he's heard somebody call his name. So it's always best not to speak to the, to the person, not to speak to the guide dog. Speak to the owner. Speak to the handler. Um, don't make eye contact with the guide dog. Because if you make eye contact, again, it's almost a, a distraction to where he sees you make eye contact and he's automatically going to forget that he's working and want to come say hello. <laughs> so that's never, never good. Are you stretching? My goodness. Yeah, he decides to stretch. Graham, I'm not as interactive as you are. He's bored to death over here. <laughs> well, I think it's very important as when mm -hmm. to know. When he's got that harness on, yes. he's working, mm -hmm. and so you shouldn't come up and pet him. When this harness is, a lot of people mm -hmm. want to pet him, right? Right. Mm -hmm. When this harness is on, at all times, you're not allowed to come up and pet him. Now, if I know the person, I will take the harness off, and we'll put the dog at rest, and and then 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 let someone meet Cody or whatever. But I try. Well, I do not. I do not do it in harness. I've. I've Every guide dog owner, I think, has made that mistake once or twice. And it's one of those mistakes that you, you don't make because it distracts the dog and it question? teaches the dog other questions. We have questions. Sure. We do have uh, a couple of calls. We have one from Mobile County. Okay. Hello. Well, my question wasn't particularly about a guide dog. For the blind, it's about people bringing in pets that they say are for emotional support and that they have papers, but then they have to go to the GI lab or they have to go to outpatient surgery or inpatient surgery, and they're not bringing someone with them to care for the dog, to take the dog out, to take them to the bathroom, to feed them. Um, so I guess... What happens if we ask the questions? What does the dog perform for you? What is the task? And well, they can't well, come across with it. How do we, yeah, I mean, what do we say to them? How can we take care uh, of that issue of them having a dog that's just kind of their pet in the room? Right. And I would just say, look, I would just restate, just say, look, that we, that, that we can only allow service animals. Your dog is not a service animal. It's a, it's a, it is a pet or it's a most support animal or therapy animal. And we don't allow those in. I mean, that's the, you know, and I guess you have safety, legitimate safety reasons you would have in that setting for not allowing in. So you're saying, so so we tell them not to bring it in there. They may have to reschedule their appointment if that's possible and bring them another time. And, and is, your, is yours like a doctor's office? Do they have surgery no, there? No, this is an inpatient hospital. Inpatient hospital, okay. And they're coming with nobody else to take the dog home. Just them in the room with their dog. And again, that, that's one thing that have to the owner does have to have to take care of their animal. Provide you're not responsible for taking care of their animal or cleaning up after it. So that's so we can that, demand that they have someone come and relieve the dog, yeah, take the dog away. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I mean, otherwise they may have to reschedule whatever. Uh, and again, there it may be different when there's an emergency situation. And the person has, and they live alone. They have nobody else. But they, I, I imagine, people with fully trained animals, or they usually have a mechanism for doing that. And I know there might be some people that are self-trained. So I'm not trying to give you a simple answer to a complex question, 
but I think what you're asking is a really good one. But an individual with this, with that, whatever kind of animal they're talking about, has to be able to take care of it. I mean, that's up to them to do it. And if your hospital has a policy of allowing therapy or most support animals, they can go beyond the ADA and allow those, you know, in the patient rooms with the person. Mm -hmm. But again, um, the person has to take care of their own animal. So if they don't have somebody to take care of it, y'all may want to modify your policy where you have something in writing saying that, you know, notifying people that if you have a service animal, uh, you allow service animal, but the owner still has to have them under their control. They have to have a way to take care of them, and that the hospital is not responsible for taking care of the service animal. And then if you have a policy that allows comfort or therapy animals in, then you can have the same policy. I mean, it's mm -hmm. not a surcharge or something. You're not charging somebody for having those. They have to take care of them. Right. And, and, I, and I think we're kind of borderline. The, the recent ones we've had, I think, are like you spoke of earlier, that people are abusing the, abusing the, the laws and, and the ADA and, and getting dogs and things in for, for reasons that may not be real. But we're, it's hard to figure out how to sort that out. Sure. And, and you can call me if you would like, if you have a particular situation that arises. I can give you some non-binding information. And I can tell maybe with a particular situation, if you'd like to call me later at the numbers on the slides in here, I'll be glad to talk to you more detail. Oh, uh, that would be wonderful. Yes, please call me. I mean that. When I, when I ask people to call me, please do, and we try to get with you the same day. So great question, though. Thank you. Do oh, we, thank you. One other question? Yes, we have another call from Bay Manette. Go ahead. Hey, good afternoon. Good afternoon. We appreciate you having this educational opportunity for us. We're calling from Bay Minette, Alabama. Our question is, do we have some sort of a stronger definition as to well-groomed? As we have seen, we have quite a few um, individuals with service animals that have different definitions of that. So we were wondering if there are any specific guidelines as to the condition of grooming an animal needs. Uh, well, to fall as well groomed. That's a good question. Again, well groomed, it's going to be case by case. But I would say there's certain things. If they smell, if bugs are jumping off of them, you know, those type of things. Well groomed means they're taken care of. There's not a specific definition, but I mean, I could look and see. I could do further legal research on it for you and see if there's any case law on that. But I'm not aware of it right now. But but when I mention well-groomed, if they smell, if they're dirty, if they're filthy, I mean, can you give me more specifics on an example of something somebody's trying to argue was well-groomed, but in your mind was not well-groomed? Sure. We actually have a gentleman, um, an elderly gentleman that's wheelchair-bound that has a chihuahua. And he will put a, um, an old pillow in the basket on his wheelchair and put the dog on that pillow. Um, and the pillow is stained and thrilled and sometimes does smell. Okay. Whether he's bathed the animal or not, he's still putting it on that same pillow. Gotcha. And, and you think this is a service animal? <laughs> he claims it is, yes. It doesn't, what does it do for him? Did you ask him the, the questions like, you know, what does it do for him because of his disability? He's a wheelchair user. But what sure. does it actually he, do? If it's sitting in the basket on a pillow, what is it really doing? His response to that was it helps to notify him when his um, diabetes is getting out of control. Okay, good. That's a pretty good thing to say. It's one of those where you can't prove a negative kind of thing. Sure. But, but I mean, he, that's where people have enough, a little bit of knowledge of dangerous things. So, so, it, so normally that's when somebody's sleeping that the, that the dog does that. So you could say, so what does it do when you sleep? You might ask him that. And he says, well, you know, I keep him in the back room I'm sleeping because he barks so much, you know. There might be other things. I mean, I, that one is sounding very suspicious. I don't know if you could prove that. But the biggest thing is I'm not sure that's well-groomed if the, the dog's laying on the pillow. I mean, yes, sir. if somebody came in there and they stunk, would you turn somebody down? I mean, 
What? No, we bathe them. <laughs> okay, there you go. So, is there anything that you could say? Look, can you wash the pillow? Sure. Yeah. yeah you, I think you can make that request to him. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it is. Is it kind of a a health hazard being that? You know, there, if it smells that bad, it probably has a lot of germs on it. Maybe right. Sure. I mean, that's somebody. That's one of those situations, I'm afraid, where somebody knows enough to be dangerous. And so yeah. they said, oh, yeah, there's diabetes. I got diabetes. And you can't ask them for proof of their diabetes for the purpose mm -hmm. of this. You can't ask them what their disability is. He knows that. Okay, and how are you so going to prove it? Would be appropriate for us to ask a little bit more about the task? And in the event that we determine that the animal is not well groomed, can we ask the gentleman, approach him, and ask him that he uh, takes care of cleaning the, the, the animal on the pillow? Yes, I would ask him that. Okay. I'm not sure what you can do about asking him. You know, you could say so. You could say something like, "Well, does he does he help you when you sleep? Does he does he help detect you know low blood sugar?" And, and I guess giving him the answer, he'll say, "Yeah, of course he does." And I'm not really sure how effective that's going to be. So I, I would suggest that you um, you just monitor the situation and see if there's anything okay. that would. What we what you want is credible assurance, and this is what they told us, Department of Justice. If there's credible assurance. They told us in a similar circumstance. They said if something happens to to uh, to cause you to doubt what he's told you, then then you can act on that. So. Okay. Thank you so much. I appreciate your help. Oh, you're welcome. We do have uh, another email. This actually comes from okay. Kristen out of state. It's a yes. two-part question. I'll read it for you. Okay. Although facilities may not ask for documentation currently, do you see this changing in the future? We often get this question from facility owners. You started to describe what can be asked when someone is carrying a small Fifi-type dog. You mentioned that you can ask them to demonstrate the task the dog does for you, but you then said they can describe it. Which is the appropriate method to request this information from the handler? Well, handler. Mo most people, okay, I think the, uh, for the first thing, I think because of the abuse of service animals, okay, people trying to disguise pets as service animal, I think it's probably coming to ask for certification. I think that's probably going to be a requirement. Okay, I can't I can't, I can't predict what the United States Congress will do. Not many people can. Nothing against them, but things change a lot up there. So, uh, but I think it could, it seems to me it's heading that direction. And then the answer to the other question, I think the safest thing to do is say what, describe or demonstrate, give them the option, describe or demonstrate what task it performs for you. So, most of them are going to describe instead of demonstrate, but you can give them that option to say describe or demonstrate. All right, well, I know we're right up. Uh, I've got two more minutes on the official watch, but is it different on the, uh, on the, the, the uh, television reporters here? So, okay, and I just wanted to, to wrap up with Tim, and I, w I wanted to first of all thank you for the opportunity today to speak to you. It's a wonderful audience. Thank you for the excellent questions, both in person here and in, in, in the uh, internet land, or um, appreciate that, or on the phone. I appreciate these great questions. I also wanted to thank Tim Emmons, Timothy Emmons, I call him Tim because we're friends, yes. so. But Tim Emmons, to thank him very much and thank Angel Hall for giving him a ride here today. Um, I wanted to thank him for demonstrating to you his service animal. And, and some of the particular things about service animals. And, and you can tell, you can usually tell when it's a bona fide service animal, but if there's something that causes you to have a reason not to, ask reasonable questions. Then if it gets the person has enough knowledge to be dangerous, then I recommend that you back off, okay? Because it's not worth it, you know, leave room to fight another day. Just back mm -hmm. off. It, you know, and just go on to the next person. I think that's all the time we have. Thank you very much. You've been a great audience, and I'm, I'm sorry again for my cell phone ringing. I had it turned off, but, you know, I'm glad I didn't tell, I asked you guys to turn your cell phones off. So, anyway, so thank you for your patience. Yes.
like to thank you, Graham, for being here today, and thank each of you for watching. As a reminder, today's program will be available on demand. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.